All right, here's a crowd pleaser. You all remember the Edge, right? The zombified Xbox 360 that Nivius Media stuck into a weird little PC case back in the mid 2000s and sold as a Windows Media Center extender. You remember how we all bullied him in high school? Well, here is what he looks like now. I mean, come on, you didn't think I was just gonna leave it the way it was, right? That'd be cruel. Uh, the last time we saw this thing, it couldn't do anything really, uh, but now it can play games. Uh, in fact, it, it plays them real good. Uh, if you don't believe me, here, let's, uh, let's see if I can do some Dark Souls on a seven inch monitor that's four feet away from me. I'm taking bets on how long I live. I, I can't even see this guy's shield. It's so small. I didn't know it was blocking. Well, that's all right. I can't, I can't get a parry reliably under normal circumstances. I'll take it. <laughs> I thought they were all gonna shoot me at once. That's what normally happens. There we go, good enough. Okay, so. Uh, if you didn't watch the last video, then none of this is going to mean anything, and it'd take way too long to explain it all again. So, if you want all the context, just hit the link in the description. It's only another hour out of your day, right? No big deal. Uh, but if you don't feel like knowing what's going on, here's the bottom line. The thing next to me is an Xbox 360. It's a completely ordinary, bog-standard, 2007-era retail console, and the reason it looks weird is because a company named Nivius Media bought this thing off the shelf, gutted it, and stuffed the entrails into this huge metal box. Here, I'll show you. And there we go. I mean, Okay, well, maybe you don't know what a 360 looks like inside, but uh, trust me, it looks like that. This is pretty much the whole machine. Uh, an Xbox 360 consists of basically just two circuit boards, uh, that one and that one. Uh, the only other component they have is a DVD-ROM drive, which, now that we think of it, it's uh, conspicuously missing. And that really sucks because without the DVD-ROM, a 360 really isn't a 360 at all. Now, I pontificated on this at great length in the last video, but suffice to say, of the many things an Xbox can do, most of them don't work without the DVD drive. So if you bought this machine back in late 2007, early 2008, whenever they were first sold, you would find that it couldn't play DVD movies and couldn't play games. And well, that's pretty much everything you'd wanna do, so why would you buy one of these? Well, you'd buy it because the one remaining feature it can do is connect to a PC running Windows Media Center and play videos and music from your media library over your home network. And I'm just gonna assume that you didn't even know an Xbox could do that because most people I've talked to who owned one back in the day didn't know either. This is funny because the option is just, it's just there in the menu. It says Windows Media Center. You just pick it and it would tell you what to do, but that's how nerds are, right? Our brains just filter out anything that we think is for someone else, and I guess this got caught in the net. It's kind of a long-standing theme on my channel, actually. Anyway, all those other missing features didn't really bother Nivius because this is the only one they cared about. For complicated reasons related to the release of Windows Vista, the company desperately needed something they could sell to customers that would play video from a Windows PC, and the only thing on the market that could do that was an Xbox 360. So they bought those and turned them into something their customers could tolerate. They put the guts of the console into this big heavy metal box that looks good under some rich guy's expensive TV. And it also doubles as a gigantic heat sink because it's, well, it's made out of heat sinks. Because the 360, for all of its capabilities, had one very irritating quality, or rather two. It had a pair of fairly audible fans in the back, which ran pretty much all the time and could become considerably more audible when the machine was overheated. Which was often. Nivius wanted to make this machine inaudible, and they had some expertise doing that, since their stock and trade was custom PCs with passive cooling systems. The first video in this series, in fact, was about one of those, uh, and it was exactly what it sounds like, a completely fanless PC that produced almost zero noise. Now, this thing is not really that. In fact, um, they've actually added fans. This has one more fan than the 360 did. But 
All three of these are running at very low speeds and are in fact almost silent. And that's possible because of the enormous heat pipe system in here that replaced the 360's original cooler. It takes all the heat output from the CPU and GPU and dumps it directly into these gigantic external heat sinks. So functionally, uh, the critical parts of this machine are cooled entirely by convection. The fans, as far as I can tell, are only there to cool off like the chipset, the VRMs, stuff like that down on the board. And those only need a tiny bit of airflow to be comfortable. So it's a cool idea, right? It's a totally silent Xbox 360. I mean, who's got one of those? Well, some people might actually, because there were a couple companies selling liquid cooler kits for these things back in the day. And those may have been quiet, but they also have had the usual water cooling issues, right? You know, pumps that fail, seals that leak, that sort of thing, which was way more common back then than it is now. And it's still pretty damn common now. This, on the other hand, has no moving parts. If you don't, if you don't count all the fans. And it can't leak corrosive liquid all over the board, so it kind of wins this argument in my book. The problem is, it was built very poorly because Nivius Media was a mess. Uh, since I began this series, I've spoken to two ex-employees, and they both told me the same thing. Nivius was extremely small, not very professionally run, they had no money, no real experts on staff, and they didn't care about build quality at all because they were just angling to get themselves noticed and bought up by some huge corporation. They weren't exactly frauds, but they weren't trying to make the best product, just something that was technically what it said in the brochure. And for the most part, this seems to be what they did. Their products worked, but they put no effort into them that they didn't have to. This thing though, this is worse than the rest. Nobody loved the Edge. It only existed so that Nivius could keep selling their main product, the one they actually cared about. So the only priority was getting something into customers' houses as quickly as possible at the lowest possible cost. And as a result, this thing has a lot of problems. The build quality is terrible, up to and including very dangerous electrical safety violations. It's been stuffed very crudely into a case that doesn't actually fit it. And of course, it can't run games. Now, I've considered some theories for why they did this, why they got rid of the DVD-ROM. I think that they could have retained it if they wanted to, and there were several strong arguments for doing so, but I actually kind of suspect that they got rid of it on purpose. I think that maybe they wanted to render the thing incapable of playing games on purpose because they weren't sure if it actually could. The um, passive cooling system in here is pretty neat, but how's it actually perform? Like, is it good? Is it as good as the uh, 360's original heatsink? I don't know. And maybe they didn't either. Could it hold up to the 360's full power output? I imagine they were pretty concerned that it wouldn't. Remember that these were the glory days of the Red Ring of Death, okay? 360s were dropping like flies back in 2007, and the only thing that could prevent it was to just not use your console. Well, I imagine that when you're using one of these as a Windows Media Center extender, they consume something like probably 30 or 40 watts, and given that the 360 maxed out at nearly 200 watts, that is essentially not using it. You see what I'm getting at? Given that Nivius imposed a 500% markup on this thing, they didn't want a customer to spend $1,500 on one of their hand-built, extremely labor-intensive hack jobs and then let their kids stick Halo 3 in it and cook the thing to death. So, yeah, it all makes a kind of sense. The Edge is a bizarre product, but there's parallels. There are, there are things like this, and I think their target market probably loved it and, and didn't give a single shit that it couldn't play games, but I do. I give lots of shits, and apparently all my viewers do too, because after I released the last video, I got a ton of comments demanding to see this thing play games. And I can't blame you. I am incredibly curious if this company that nobody has ever heard of built a bunch of Xbox 360s that can play games without making any noise at all. That sounds incredibly dope, and I absolutely want to know if they pulled it off. Well, most of those comments seemed confused as to why I didn't test this. And I left the explanation out of the last video because it's pretty involved. But basically, I didn't play any games on this because it's impossible. Without the DVD-ROM, you can't put Halo 3 in this thing. And, okay, I could connect to the internet and download Halo 3, but there's problems with that. I need somewhere to download it too, and, well, after Nivius was done with this thing, you couldn't exactly plug a, a hard drive into it anymore. It's kind of, um, there's, there's a lot of things in the way that make that impossible. I, I mean, it's not impossible. I, I obviously did it. You can see 
right there that I did it, but it is a hurdle to overcome. And even if you clear that, uh, you still have the problem that uh, a 360 can't connect to Xbox Live unless it's been fully updated. Uh, this one, however, was apparently in someone's closet since it was made because it still has the original firmware. That's right, it's got the Blades dashboard. If I publicly upgraded this thing, people would come to my house in the night with weapons. It, it kind of sucks having a Blades 360 in your possession, actually. It's kind of a millstone. You can't touch it, you can't break it, uh, you can't change it in any way. You just have to carry it like an egg in a spoon till you find someone you can hand it off to. Besides that, I've heard that Microsoft might ban you from live if they detect that your console has an altered or missing DVD-ROM, and it's not clear whether that's true. Some people disagree, but the, the point is, I'd have to upgrade the thing, make everyone mad at me, and then it might still just not work. On top of that, I'd have to then buy games from the store despite already owning them on disc, which is dumb and I'm not doing that. Now, of course, a bunch of people asked why I don't just plug in a different DVD-ROM, and that's a great question because it's an excuse for me to be mad about this. I do have a dead 360 here with what I assume is a perfectly functional drive in it, and I could put this in here. I mean, there's no way to, to mount it, but I could plug it in long enough to load a game, right? Wouldn't work. Xbox 360 DVD-ROM drives, come on, get in there. Every Xbox DVD drive was locked to the console it was sold with. Every drive and motherboard contain a pair of keys that have to match. So this drive will work with this board, but if I put it in here, it'll just not work. Uh, you can put a game in and it'll look like it's loading for a moment, but it then gives an error message that says you have to put the disc into an Xbox 360. This is apparently some kind of DRM. Uh, Microsoft, I guess, had the idea that keying the drive and console together would somehow prevent piracy. As always, it did nothing of the sort. People pirated stuff immediately, but it did disproportionately harm consumers, as expected. If you had a 360 back in the day and your DVD laser died, uh, you might have gone to eBay, bought a dead machine for a hundred bucks, and swapped the drive over, only to find that you'd wasted your money. Congratulations. This is what you get for playing by the rules. Nowadays, of course, there are some options. Uh, if you have the original drive that came with your console, you can slurp the keys out of the drive and put them into a working one, but Nivius presumably threw all those into a landfill, so the drive that came with this machine is gone forever. Some people suggested that they might have resold them on eBay to recoup costs, but I doubt it. That's it's just not a thing that any business ever wants to do. And back in 2007, I don't know that there was any market value for a drive without its matching console. They were probably just e-waste. Now, I also got some enterprising commenters asking if it's possible to work around this limitation using the official HD DVD drive that Microsoft sold for the 360. That was an interesting question. I hadn't considered that. So I went out and bought one and the answer is, no, of course not. If you put in a game, it does the exact same thing. It just says it needs to be inserted into a 360. But I was surprised to learn that it also won't play HD DVDs. I swear, I remember back in the day, people said that HD DVD was the better format because it didn't have nasty DRM like Blu-ray did. And I guess that was just never true at all. Every disc I tried gave an error about needing an update that it couldn't download, and apparently that's because the 360 had to get encryption keys from Microsoft for each movie, or I don't know, for, for blocks of movies. It had to download something which is now no longer available. So I think that these drives are all now e-waste, but hey, it was worth it. The DRM was completely effective. Nobody ever managed to pirate an HD DVD, right? Some people did think to ask if it would at least play normal DVDs, and yes, it will, but to my surprise, I found that the internal drive will also play them even if it's not matched to the console. I guess the key verification or whatever only comes into play for games. But anyway, in short, it's all dead ends. There is no way to make the 360 that we saw in the last video play a game ever again, except to mod it. Now, I was very surprised by this response, but Blades Dash be damned, I got dozens of comments insisting that I should JTAG this thing. In other words, mod the board and install custom firmware that would let me run backups of games I own, but from a hard drive, so I don't need the DVD-ROM. And that is a pretty good idea. I could do that, but it's a huge pain in the ass to set that up, so I did one better. You see this 360? This is Chekhov's 360. I was waving this around throughout the whole previous video and you probably figured it was just a prop, but 
It was actually a pre-modded unit that I bought off eBay. My intent was to end the last video by swapping this board into the edge, you know, keeping everything else the same, retaining the weird cooling system, but just swapping the board for one that can actually run games and seeing how it would do. Now I decided against that because the video would have been three hours long and boy howdy, that turned out to be the right call. For one thing, I was worried that people might be upset about me altering something with historical value, but well, given all the comments I received demanding that I mod this thing and all the people not calling them ghouls, I suspect nobody actually cares, and I think that's the right call. The fact is, the Nivius Edge has no historical significance. Other than being old, it's just someone's garage modded Xbox 360. It's like something you'd see on the hard OCP forums back in the day. And the actual electronics, when it comes down to it, are nothing special. This is a bog standard Xbox that's just been made worse, and in no ways that are interesting. The metal box and the heat pipes, those are the only actual product here. The Xbox is completely fungible. Uh, think of it like those uh, Game Boy accessories that you put the whole Game Boy into. The accessory is interesting, but if the Game Boy breaks or turns yellow, you just pull it out and stick another one in there. They made millions. They're all the same. It's, it, it's fine. Now, to be fair, these machines aren't completely identical. The modded 360 started life as a 2009 model, so it had a Jasper motherboard, whereas the Edge had a Falcon. And those are a bit different, but who's counting, really? And I'm sure Nivius was just buying consoles from Best Buy anyway, so if they were still making these things in 2009, they'd have had Jaspers instead of Falcons. And, you know, this one is on the latest firmware instead of the Sacred and Holy Blades dash, but if someone had kept this edge and continued using it, eventually it would have prompted them for an upgrade and they would have hit OK. The fact these things didn't happen is just a historical accident. In other words, if I put this board in this case, the only thing that would make that different from an edge you could find in the wild is the hardware mod. But it turns out that's completely invisible. If you just turn this thing on, it behaves like a completely ordinary Xbox 360. You have to load up a special piece of software called the Aurora Dashboard to get it to do anything special. And in fact, this thing will even still connect to a Vista Media Center and do what the Edge was originally intended to do. So I'm not losing anything by modding it. I'm not really changing it in any way that matters. And most importantly, I'm making it something that someone will care about ever again. In the state that I received this, the only thing it could do was run Windows Media Center, which all 360s will do and which nobody cares about. The cooling system is neat, but nobody was ever gonna bother dragging this huge bastard out of storage just to show someone a set of pipes that don't do anything. So it would have sat for the rest of time gathering dust until it wound up in a landfill. On the other hand, if it could run GTA 5 without the typical soundtrack, that would be exciting. That would be worth dragging this big, heavy piece of crap out of the basement and hooking it up just so you can say, hey, look what this company pulled off back in 2007. So if I want this thing to not be forgotten, keeping it in its original state isn't the best way to do that. And if I do want this to get turned on and used, I certainly don't want anyone getting killed by it. And since this machine was totally ungrounded and Nivius put a power supply inside of it with exposed high voltage, it very badly needed to be taken apart and rendered safe. So I did all of the above. If you watched the previous video, you may have noticed that it looks different inside. I've made all my modifications. Uh, this one is the Jasper board. The, uh, the Halo 360 here actually is a prop now. There's, there's nothing inside. Uh, but I'm extremely pleased to report that this works perfectly. This thing not only runs games, but it does such a good job that it's actually become even more of a millstone than it was before. I was planning on giving this thing away as soon as I finished the series because it's a big inconvenient hunk of crap that doesn't do anything useful, but I think I'm just gonna keep it now because it runs like gangbusters, plus it's basically the coolest 360 I could possibly own in several senses of the word. The thermals on here are, as far as I can tell, terrific. After I finished rebuilding it, which was a miserable process, it took about three days, I tested it out, I ran some games and it seemed to work, but I wanted to, to give it a good stress test. So I brought it into the studio, I set it up and I played games on stream for about four hours. Perfect. Outstanding. Oh, come on, come on, keep going. Ah, oh, damn, dude, come on, you can do it. My favorite thing about Skate is that you can just not. You can just decide not to. You know what, actually, I don't care about skating anymore. I'm done with this. I'm a track star. Let's go. I can do it. I'm, I'm skating. We're gonna grind this cement wall. It 
10 or 20 minutes. Done. <laughs> That's comfortable. I like it here, actually. Can we, can we quap our way to the exit here? Come on. We're quapping right now. What's the pattern? What's the frequency, Kenneth? Come on. You, you, give us moves. Yes, you. Give us Zeki. Honk. Thank you for playing. You know what? The proper attire for footballer. Playing Dark Souls naked. Four stars. Playing Dark Souls with only one very silly article of clothing. Twelve stars. The first time I came through this uh, particular area, I was mad, sad, and got my ass handed to me. But this time around, I'm older and <laughs> gets owned, gets rocked immediately. <laughs> Doesn't even finish killing the first guy correctly. Runs away. Well, it's a technique. It's a strat. That's not a good one. Oh, it's not a good one. In 400 yards, you will arrive at your destination. I have no idea how to benchmark one of these things, so I kind of considered Forza Horizon 2 my stress test game, just because it came out in 2014. I figured it was probably way overkill for the 360's hardware, but really it didn't seem to matter what I ran. The temps stayed very consistent in everything. I was playing for hours in a pretty warm office with no air conditioning, and this thing never got much above 60 degrees Celsius. Now, there's a lot of people quoting different base temps for the 360 online, so I'm not sure what I should be comparing to, but I think 60 degrees is about typical for a Jasper in good condition with fresh thermal paste and whatnot, and it's a hell of a lot cooler than the typical slim models, which apparently run between 70 and 85 degrees. So this is either a significant improvement or not any worse than stock. I don't know which, but it's clearly doing just fine. Oh, that doesn't really surprise me though, because from the get-go, I felt that this cooling system was massively overbuilt. I mean, the thermal capacity of these copper heat risers alone probably exceeds either of the original heat sinks. And with about four feet of heat pipe stacked too high, not to mention these gigantic outer aluminum sinks, this is just a tremendous amount of mass and volume dedicated to cooling two little tiny chips. That's probably why none of it really gets noticeably hot. The sinks, the pipes, the risers, they all get tangibly warm, but that's it. I mean, you can barely tell the thing is operating. I checked it with a thermal camera a few times while I was gaming just for good measure, but there was just nothing going on. The hottest components were a VRM and what I think is the chipset, and neither one broke 55 Celsius, so yeah, who can complain? In fact, I even got the wireless gamepad working and that kind of surprised me. I hadn't actually tested this before I, I did the whole mod because I just assumed it wouldn't work. I'd never thought about where the RF module was in a 360, but I assumed Nivius would have just pulled it out and thrown it away. But as it turns out, the RF receiver uh, for the gamepad is on the front panel board. Uh, I think this here is a flat patch antenna and the receiver itself is, I don't know, it's under that or on the back side. It's, it's there somewhere. And this whole board, is still inside the edge right there, unmodified. So I figured I'd give it a shot and it worked. I mean, you saw me using it earlier. Now that didn't surprise me too much since the board is there and intact, but I figured that it would stop working once I put the lid on because at this point, the antenna is basically inside a Faraday cage. Uh, that's actually why the receiver was on the front panel board to begin with. This is how the original 360 is built. You've got this metal shield that surrounds it on all sides. There's usually a, a lid up here as well. And the whole point of that shield is to block radio frequency signals. So Microsoft put the receiver out here because it's outside that cage. But since Nivius didn't care about that, they just, uh, you know, amontillado the receiver up inside the case. And since this aluminum is now all grounded, thanks to, to me, I figured it would absorb the signal. To my great astonishment though, even with the lid on, the 360 gamepad works just fine. By all rights, this shouldn't work at all, but I haven't had any issues with it, no latency, nothing like that. In fact, it even works from a distance. See, I'm about 20 feet away, no problem. So, yeah, I have no idea why this works. I really expected a grounded aluminum box to block the signal, but it doesn't. Maybe the holes in the top are too big, I don't know.
At any rate though, like I said, the thing is grounded now, so it's considerably safer than it was before. It doesn't tingle when you touch the outside. It's also a bit less stupid inside in a few ways. I improved on several of Nidius's odd decisions while I was in there, while making a few other things worse. The process of rebuilding this thing was actually really interesting, at least to me. It was almost like redoing Nivius's work from scratch. I had to figure out what had to be done to the console to fit it in here, what had to be removed, what was and wasn't possible, and so on. I had to kind of reevaluate the whole thing, and that helped me get inside the heads of the people who designed it in the first place. And what I discovered is that they really did suck at this, uh, sometimes worse than I'd realized. There are some egregious decisions hidden inside this machine, but there were also a couple that made more sense once I had to go through that process myself. And I recorded all this, so since it was so illuminating, I will now present a supercut of the whole three-day process. Trust me, it'll be fun. Or not. Your call. I began by disassembling the donor Xbox, so if you've never seen that done, here you go. It's pretty straightforward for the most part, but Microsoft used some real next-level plastic tab techniques. Even with an iFixit guide, a YouTube demo, and a ton of patience, I still managed to snap off a tab. The rest pretty much just comes apart effortlessly. It's mostly held together with a bunch of extremely long screws, which was apparently a common practice for consoles in this era. Once those are out, you can lift out the DVD-ROM, set it aside, then struggle with the fan and duct assembly for four or five minutes to get it out without breaking anything, then unscrew and remove the front panel board, set that aside, unscrew a bunch more bolts that hold in the motherboard, and there you go. It's pretty much all apart now. The only thing left is the heatsink, and that's kind of a puzzle. Microsoft used a very novel clamp, which I would never have figured out without a tutorial. There's no ordinary fasteners, just a metal clip, which will only come off if you stick a screwdriver behind one of the pegs and wedge it in what appears to be the wrong direction. If you do this hard enough, the opposite end will suddenly pop loose. Repeat on the opposite axis and the whole thing pretty much falls off. I guess it prevents over torquing the sink during assembly, but it does not feel great to remove. I was relieved, by the way, to see that the workmanship on the mod was nice and clean. There's a lot of people out there selling modded consoles that are just a spiderweb of bodge wires and awful soldering work, but this one seems pretty good. The wires are routed, there aren't any huge globs of hot glue, etc. Shout out to eBay seller Infinite Modifications, thank you for not ripping me off. With the board out, I put it in a box, set it aside, then started taking apart the Nivius, a process I hadn't been looking forward to. The first thing I had to pull was the cooling system. It holds the board in place, and that holds everything else in place. I unscrewed the bolts from the cooling towers, or whatever you want to call them, and that took quite a bit of force. I suspect Nivy has put Loctite on the threads. I can't be sure since they were coated in grease. Any residue probably came off when I cleaned them up, but they felt locked to me. Next, I removed the bolts from the heatsink clamps. That was an exciting experience. Unlike all the other fasteners in Nivius's products, these had imperial heads. I had to dig through every bit I had in the house to find a non-metric hex bit that fit. Fan number three also made things tough. I could have pulled that out, but it stuck down with VHB tape, and I'm not sure it would have come off anyway or wanted to go back on, so I just used a ratchet and an extension, which was the right call anyway since those bolts were in there pretty good. The second clamp is also a bit hard to reach. It wouldn't come out until I removed the front panel board and the power supply cover. At this point, I had to start dismantling the copper towers and removing the pipes themselves, and needless to say, everything was coated in thermal grease, which I guess beats the alternative, right? This is just the plain white stuff. They probably bought a five-gallon bucket of it for 40 bucks because they used tons. It slopped on so thick that one of the slugs actually came up with the pipe. Fortunately, though, this all seems to be good. It's not dried out. It's not separating, so it wasn't the worst stuff they could have used. When I removed the last slug, I noticed something odd that I'd seen in the Nivius Denali. There's a rectangular slot cut into the slug that matches one in the slug that sits on top of the CPU. It looks like a flat heat pipe would go here, but there isn't one, so I have no idea what this is for. With everything now out except the slugs attached to the board, I naturally went over everything with isopropyl and a rag, scrubbed off all the old compound, and since it's still liquid, it comes off fairly easily from things like the pipes, but the other parts were... A bit more tedious. With all the sharp edges and the deep grooves and the slugs and clamps, I went through a ton of paper towels and q-tips getting every little bit of gunk off every edge and crevice. The whole thing was fiddly and miserable, but I got it done in the end. Next, I removed the power supply since it's taking up so much space. The AC wires are still trapped under the board, but I don't intend to reuse this supply, so I just cut the inlet wires, pulled it loose, and chucked it. 
I then removed all the screws from the motherboard and tried to pull it out, but it didn't want to come out. It felt like it was still held down somewhere, but it turns out the extension cables are just so tightly crammed in here and so stiff that they hold the board in place. With some fiddling, I got them all loose and the board came right out. Oh my god! What?! And this is where I realized how Nivius had solved the RAM cooling problem. In the 360 case, I think the RAM chips are pressed against the steel shell, and that helps dissipate heat. But here, they float half an inch above the base plate, so Nivius just stacked up a bunch of roughly cut thermal pads to fill that gap. This seems to work, I guess, but the right way to do it was probably to put some actual metal in there. Pro tip for you, Nivius. The board is still tethered by the IR assembly, so I had to remove that from the front panel, and that's very strange. They used some little chunk of plastic to hold the sensor in place. I'm sure they didn't have this made. It's obviously from something else, but I have no idea what. Now, this flying lead here, this was originally soldered to a pin on the DVD-ROM header, presumably to hold the drawer status pin down so the 360 doesn't think the drive is open all the time, and I wanted to do this more elegantly, so I desoldered it, but I then found the other end was stuck to the power button. Uh, that should have been a red flag, uh, a sign that I'd misidentified this, but... I'm me, so I plowed ahead. I wanted to remove the power switch so I could desolder the wire, but I couldn't get a wrench that fit it, so I just snipped it off. We'll, we'll revisit that later, don't worry. With the board now out of the case, we can get a better look at the quality of Nivius's work, or lack thereof. I remember thinking when I first looked at this thing that the X-shaped brackets looked exactly like the ones they used in the Denali. Those looked like Socket 775 Intel coolers that they'd torn apart, and this was confirmed by one of the employees I spoke to. I found it remarkable that those just happened to fit the Xbox 360 motherboard, but it turns out they didn't. Nivius ground down the legs of the brackets, as you can see from the rough texture on the ends, and then used a drill press to add new holes. Now, this would almost be a good idea, except the legs aren't flat. Intel stamped ridges into the legs to make them stiffer, and Nivius did nothing to flatten those, so the nuts are sitting on rounded surfaces. Naturally, that makes them sit at quite a jaunty angle, and they're almost certainly applying very uneven pressure to the chips. Well, at least they would if they were actually torqued down, which they aren't. At least one of these was just spinning in place, doing nothing at all. So, yeah, this is truly awful workmanship. It's worse than what you'd typically see on a beginner case mod project, and we'll see more of this later. Unsurprisingly, there are no mysteries in the chassis. It's just a metal box with some standoffs in it. I was surprised to see that they're actually pressed into the sheet metal, though. You'd expect that from a mass-produced device, but for this sort of thing, I figured they'd be just bolted through drilled holes. These base plates were reused from one of their HTPCs, so I wonder if they actually had them remachined to fit the 360, or if it just so happens that enough holes line up with ATX that they got lucky. Anyway, to wrap up with the chassis, I removed the IEC inlet, which we'll be working on later, cleaned as much thermal compound as I could off the heat sinks, and then got out the multimeter to start checking continuity. This chassis is not currently grounded, and that doesn't have to be unsafe, but with the build quality of this thing, it is. So I intend to add a ground lead. The trouble is, I'm not sure if the whole chassis can be earthed from a single point. Everything's touching, but the anodized surfaces of the aluminum parts are not reliably conductive. They seem to be connected when I tested with the machine all assembled, but I suspect the motherboard's ground plane was joining everything together. And sure enough, with the board removed, I found that some parts are not continuous with others. Most of them are, though, particularly the parts near the AC inlet, and when I'm done, that should be the only place where a dangerous fault can really exist, so I decided this was adequate for now. At some later date, I might add straps between the heat sinks to make it better. I now had to get the copper slugs off the CPU and GPU, and I thought the biggest hurdle here would be trying not to put uneven pressure on the dies as I remove the brackets, but yeah, that was the least of my problems. This sucked. Nivius used nuts and bolts to hold the brackets on, so I had to use a socket wrench and a screwdriver on opposite sides of the boards at a very awkward angle to get them out. And that's bad enough, but they'd also put red Loctite on everything, and since that's meant to be more or less permanent, I had to put a ton of force into these fasteners at that awkward angle. And even that wouldn't be so bad, but the hardware they used was literally garbage. The screws are slot heads, which is the worst, most slip-prone head, and they're made of brass, the softest material you can make a fastener out of. This whole thing was a nightmare. I rounded out at least three of the heads, my driver nearly slipped and gouged a hole in the board every time, and one rounded out so bad that I had to go get a pair of vice grips to hold it in place so I could take the nut off. I mean, this was just harrowing, especially since I really did want to avoid damaging the board so it could be reused in something else. 
in the end, I think I got everything out without any damage, but the fasteners were just cooked. And I mean, look at these things. They're literally cabinet hardware. They're intended for looks and nothing else. Even if they were intact enough to reinstall, you couldn't pay me to use them. I'm going to replace them when we put it all back together. Now, with the sinks removed, I wanted to see what the dyes looked like, so I got some Q-tips and IPA, and I started scrubbing away at the thermal grease, but after the bulk of the white stuff was gone, I found a layer of gray stuff underneath, and that took 10 times as long to remove. I ultimately had to scrape it off with a hard plastic tool because the Q-tips and solvent weren't even touching it. I suppose this could be cooked on remnants of the white stuff, but my suspicion is that it's actually the original compound that Microsoft applied, and Nivius just made no effort to remove it. With the dyes cleaned up, I turned my attention to the copper slugs. I was curious what the dye to sink interface looked like, so I wiped off the grease, I took a look, and I had to blink a few times to make sure my eyes were working, because this, this is not what a heat sink should look like. Thermal grease is supposed to fill gaps, sure, but not impact craters. I, I have no idea what happened here. There are machining marks, so clearly these were turned on a lathe at some point, but... The results of turning can only be so bad. The worst Harbor Freight lathe in the world is going to produce a pretty clean surface finish, at least compared to this. I mean, this is horrifying. The only explanation I can think of is that Nivius had these made all the way back in like 2004 for their first product, the uh, Rainier Media Center. And then over the following four years, they just threw them all in a box and let them rattle around and bang against each other because they look about as scarred and pockmarked as the surface of the goddamn moon. The idea of reusing these things hurts. I admit I was tempted to go beyond a simple cleanup. I mean, these deserve to be, well, more than lapped. They deserve to be ground, sanded from 200 grit up to 2000, and then lapped. But unfortunately, I can't. The point of this whole endeavor is to perform an experiment, so my hands are tied. I want to know if Nivius made something that could run games, and this is what they shipped, so this is what I have to test. If I improved it, it wouldn't prove anything. So as much as it pains me, I did nothing more than wipe these off and I will later install them again in this exact condition onto a CPU and GPU. May God have mercy on my soul. This actually stung so much that I felt I had to do something. So after I'd cleaned up all the grease, I found the slugs that sit on top of each tower and I ran each one over a piece of wet 330 grit just until they were shiny on top. That won't affect the performance at all, but it's considerably less depressing to look at than what Nivea shipped. So it was the least I could do for this poor machine. I should mention, the reason I'd had the sandpaper on hand was to help with grounding the chassis. There's a bunch of unused bolt holes in the heat sinks, and I figured I could attach a ground strap to one of them, but I had to take the anodized surface layer off first to make it properly conductive. Now, there are clean ways to do this, but I just used the sandpaper to scuff up the surface around one of the holes, made sure I took it all the way down to the metal, attached a ring lug, confirmed I had continuity. It's ugly, but it works. Next, I had to deal with the IR sensor, and that was a fresh hell. It appeared that Nivius just removed the sensor that came on the 360 board, added wires to each lead, then soldered those into the through holes on the board. Basically, they just gave it really long legs, and that's not in itself too rancid, but the way they executed it was. Two of these wires desoldered with no trouble at all. I just stuck the rework gun on there, pulled the trigger, and bam, done. But the third hole just didn't want to clear. I hit it over and over, no dice. And the remaining two were completely out of the question. I'm pretty sure they're attached to a ground plane, so you could pour a ton of heat into them before you melt the solder, and that's a tough nut for anyone to crack, but Nivius was clearly not up to the task at all because they didn't even bother trying. Instead, they just cut the legs off the IR sensor and tagged the wires onto the tips. Now, this is a filthy solution, and I wasn't willing to leave it or replicate it, so I got out the donor board to see if I could figure out where things went wrong. It turns out that the IR sensor has three active pins near the edge of the board, then a couple of mounting pins behind those, which come pre-bent into a kind of waffle fry shape. This helps them stick into the board, but once they're installed, the solder assumes a very complex shape. So even if you manage to melt it, you can't get it out with wick or a vacuum, and unless you understand the geometry, it's not clear that it's possible or safe to just pull the pins straight out. It actually is, you just have to know what you're doing, and Nivius didn't. I mean, I only barely know what I'm doing, and it was still easy to get the thing out. I just cleared out the three signal leads, uh, heated up the two uh, mounting pins, pulled the thing out. That was pretty much it. I went back to the old board after that, got that cleaned up without too much fuss either, uh, pulled out the uh, two mounting legs, also found a leg stuck in one of the other pads. Apparently someone got impatient, clipped one of the signal leads. No idea why they would have done that, but okay. The result is admittedly uglier than it could be. Uh, this can be done better, but it's probably still perfectly functional, and that's what me working on an already butchered board. So Nivius really had no excuse for quarter-assing it the way they did.
Since I was now feeling so self-righteous, I proceeded to do an equally crappy job of installing the wires into the new board. I couldn't get them straight or even. I think I melted the insulation. It's, it's pretty ugly. And it wasn't until much later that I realized the two shield leads are probably purely for mechanical stability. Nivius didn't even need to connect them, and I could have clipped them out and just installed a 1x3 pin header and put a socket on the flying leads. It'd be a much cleaner solution, and it'd also be unpluggable. I guess I'll remember that for the next time I put an Xbox 360 in a custom chassis. But at this point, the donor board has been fully modded. The only thing they actually changed after all was the IR sensor. Everything else just plugs in or bolts on, so I dry fit it in the new chassis just to make sure everything was copacetic, and of course it fit just fine. The Jasper and Falcon used identical cases, uh, what people call the FAT design, which means it has to use the exact same mounts, I.O. holes, chip locations, etc. The actual components are quite different, but they all have to be in the same places. So, we're good to go on fitment, but I have to install the cooler before we can actually start reassembling, so the board comes back out. I clean all the gunk off the chips, and since it's less than six months old, it comes off nice and clean. It's now time to address that mounting hardware. As I mentioned, the nuts literally cannot sit flat on the bracket due to the curved surface. So, I thought of a simple solution to this. I took a bracket over to my vise, uh, put it on the anvil side, pounded it with the flat side of a ball peen, and that actually worked. Uh, took like a dozen strikes to flatten the portion of the arm where the hole is drilled. Doesn't look amazing. It's not perfectly level, but it's a hundred times better than it was. So, eh, that problem's solved. Now we just have to deal with the fasteners. I was still mad at the absolute garbage that Nivius used in this thing, so I spent some time at the hardware store and put together these beauties. Black oxide socket head cap screws, thick nylon washers top and bottom to cope with any remaining non-flatness, and great big brass thumb nuts, so I don't need two separate drivers to assemble or adjust anything. I think these are a huge improvement, practically speaking, but they're also much nicer looking purely because I was feeling spiteful. Now, when it comes to thermal paste, I'm generally a proponent of the Gamer's Nexus school where nothing matters as long as the grease is touching the dye somewhere. It'll spread out when you put the sink on and tighten it down. Don't worry about it. But since I'm doing this all by hand, no reactor containment, no shims, nothing to protect the dye from overpressure, I want to apply as little force as possible to get effective cooling and no more. So since there won't be much pressure, I actually bothered to spread the compound as evenly, as thinly as I could manage to give this thing a fighting chance. And with that done, we're ready to start actually assembling this thing. I popped a screw through the bottom, set one of the slugs on top of the CPU, dropped the bracket on top, and it didn't fit. It seems like the edges of the screw hole got pushed in by my amateur blacksmithing, so it's too small now. Not a huge problem. I chucked up a diamond burr in my Dremel tool, rounded the holes out again, and now the bolts fit no problem. So on my second attempt, everything went together swimmingly. Bolt through, nut on top, run it down, good to go. Now, since this is not a manufacturer intended design, there's nothing to help me ensure the pressure on the die is even, but I realized that since all the bolts are the same length, I can use the exposed threads to determine relative torque. I spun the nuts back and forth till I saw even stick out on all the bolts, and I figured that's good enough. If it's too little torque, I'll add more later, but I'd rather have too little than too much. The GPU was more the same deal, of course, uh, except that I had to grease up two dies instead of one. Uh, I'm shocked I didn't screw that up, but it actually went pretty well. Uh, put the bolts through, put the thing on, put the nuts on. A couple minutes later, sinks are on the new board, ready to go. At this point, I decided to give the thing a real quick test. Uh, I didn't want to put in hours of additional labor just to find out that I'd killed the board, so I plugged it into a supply, did a very brief power-on test. I got a picture on the screen. Slugs got hot. That told me they were making good contact without damaging anything. So, yeah, everything's still on track. I did have a couple more things to do before I started reinstalling the board. Uh, first, I removed the dead fan from the back, and in the process I found out that Nivius had the wrong size holes stamped for the fan screws. They're a bit undersized, so they had to just force the screws in. Uh, they didn't bother enlarging the holes, they just cut threads into the aluminum and flaked off the anodizing. Real professional work. Never seen, never seen anything like it. Now, regarding the fans, uh, a few commenters were curious if the board expects a tachometer signal. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, this board actually has no tach input at all. There's a single three-pin header for the fans, and that just has two five-volt pins and a ground. My guess is there's two pins, so the two fans could be PWM'd separately, but I have no idea if that's true. Uh, Nivius, for their part, just ignored the third pin, cut that wire off. All three fans are just running off a single 5-volt rail, and I didn't want to rewire any of this, so I just cut the wires from the dead fan and brought in my replacement. The new fan is a Silenx, Silenx, however you pronounce it. It's just like the others. Uh, now, I've been told that their products were actually crap and their fans die really quickly, but I found this one new in box locally, and I wanted to stick as close to the original hardware as I could. And other than the color, I think this is basically identical to the others. 
I clipped off the tack lead, stripped everything, and joined all the wires together with Western Union splices. Look that up if you don't know the technique. It, it makes for very clean work. A bit of heat shrink to insulate everything, and we're done. Now, since I had all my wire splicing stuff out, I decided I'd fix another of Nivius's weird decisions. This is the 360 DVD-ROM power and signal cable. Uh, Nivius had soldered the wire that was going to that power switch onto the DVD header directly, and I couldn't figure out why you'd do that when they definitely had this plug. They would have taken it off the drive when they removed it. You could just clip a wire here and solder to it. That's a, a lot easier and cleaner than soldering to a header. Or, you know, forget the flying lead entirely. Just cut and twist wires four and six together. That'll make the 360 think the drawer is closed and you don't need the extra wire at all. So that's what I did. We will, of course, be coming back to this later because I did screw this up. But it's finally time to start putting things back together. Of course, we'll begin with the most important part, the IR sensor. Really, though, you kind of got to put that in first. And it turns out to be very irritating since nothing holds the sensor into the little plastic bracket. So I just added a bit of double-sided tape so I wouldn't need six hands to get the job done. I'm almost ready to put in the board, but first I have to plug in all the extension cables. Uh, that's a lot harder with it bolted down, so we get those all in now. Uh, and with those in, I can drop the board in and start putting the screws in. Of course, all the screws land right where they're supposed to, because these boards have to mount in the exact same chassis, uh, except for one, which ran into this weird plastic tower. I was worried that might be a difference between the boards, but I compared to a normal 360, and yeah, apparently they just come with these. Nivius must have ripped it off. No problem, I can do the same thing. I had some further fiddling around, of course, to figure out, you know, the right order to stack the USB cables, the IR cables, the front panel cables, and, of course, in the end, I screwed it all up, and I had to pull the entire board out again and do it all over because I'd trapped the fan leads underneath. You know, what else is new? It always happens this way. But with all that done, the board was now installed. So that's 90% of the work done, and now I just had to do the other 90%. Uh, namely, that'd be the heat pipes. I could run like 40 minutes of footage of this process alone. I mean, it was just a nightmare. Uh, for one thing, I had to use like 15 grams of noctothermal compound in here because the whole system is coated in it and it contains something like a dozen metal to metal interfaces. I had to pre grease the grooves in the slugs and then that didn't turn out to be enough. So I had to take the pipes back out, manually spread the compound all around with my fingers, both in the middle and at the ends, since I wouldn't be able to get to the ends once the middle was clamped in, I went through like nine pairs of latex gloves and I got this crap everywhere. On top of that, it turns out that nothing is interchangeable. I assembled the pipe network like five times, just trying different pipes in different places, and I finally had to go back and study my earlier footage at great length to figure out what went where. I also suspect the slugs were cross-drilled as a single solid copper bar and then cut into pieces because they really seem to not be symmetric. I think every slug has to go in a specific place and a specific orientation because every time I assembled a tower, it would look sort of right. And then I tried to put the bolts in and they just wouldn't go. And then I realized the stack wasn't plumb, like all the slugs were in different places because they were being pulled side to side by the pipes. The pipes were fighting them. The grooves didn't seem to line up. It was just awful. I was forced to play a remarkably accurate game of Towers of Hanoi over and over until I got something that seemed to fit, and I still don't fully know if I got it back together in its original state, but I think I got close enough. When the bolts finally screwed down, though, I seemed to have something workable, so as a treat, I took a break and started cleaning up the compound that was smeared all over everything. I think I came up with about six grams of the stuff. I gave Nivius a ton of shit in the last two videos for not doing a better job at this, but I have to admit, there is no clean way to assemble a system this complex with parts this large and awkwardly shaped that have to attach in multiple places at once. It's gonna make a mess, and there's nothing you can do about it. So after that whole quagmire, installing the heatsink clamps seemed delightfully straightforward. The copper towers pretty much set the angles and heights of everything, so all I had to do was hold the clamps in place till I found the right bolt holes. Easy peasy. After that, I did a bit more cleaning and polishing, and then I decided to fire the thing up again to make sure everything was still working. To my great relief, it booted, the fans spun, everything looked great, except that the power light wasn't on. And I instantly knew this was my fault because it had been itching at the back of my head that I had messed something up. It was very weird when I saw that the lead from the DVD-ROM header went to the power switch. That, that was just odd. But I assumed that it was just a convenient ground, you know, something they were using as a de facto terminal strip, pretty much. But no, I was wrong. If we go back and look at my old footage, uh, pin 4 on this header tells the machine the drawer is closed, but that's this one. The wire goes to pin 6 
which is nothing more than a continuous 3.3 volt supply. I was giving Nivius way too much credit. If the 360 thinks the drawer is open, it'll blink the power light continuously, and I thought they were trying to solve that problem just in a really caveman-like way, but no, this is much worse. They ignored the power light completely. They just let it blink inside the chassis forever. The only reason they bothered touching this header was because it had a voltage that would only be present when the machine was on so they could hijack it for a power light. There is simply no end to the embarrassments on display inside this poor godforsaken machine. So I felt pretty silly for just cutting that wire without thinking, but at least I could fix it. Having built my little shunt cable, I just pulled off the heat shrink, put the bodge wire back, soldered it up, and insulated it again. Simple as that. Okay, that's, that's a lie. I had to solder it back onto the power switch too, and since I couldn't get to that with it installed, I had to find a wrench that just barely fit the nut and then tediously grind the anodizing off the aluminum until I managed to get the nut loose. It, it was miserable, I scraped up the faceplate, I cursed myself the whole time, and later I realized I could probably have just popped the faceplate off, and that would have saved me a ton of time and effort. But in any case, I got the wire soldered back on, I got it re-insulated, and with it all back together, it's only about 13% uglier than what Nivius did, and a whole lot less janky. Mine, after all, can be unplugged. So, with all that great and lengthy misery out of the way, it was time to address the elephant in the room. That is to say, an enormous gray thing that's a huge pain in the ass to deal with. This is the power supply from the Edge. It started life as a normal 360 supply, which they removed from its case and did not so much as wrap in plastic sheet before bolting it crudely into this uninsulated metal box. Now, I'd love to just put an unmodified supply, case and all, into the Edge, uh, but it turns out that Nivius had to shuck the supply to get it to fit. Otherwise, it's too long and it runs into the front panel board. Now, that board could be relocated, but that would be its own kind of hideous hack, so... Yeah, I admit Nivius didn't have a lot of great options. Fortunately, I do. Since our donor board is a Jasper, it's undergone a die shrink, and it now draws 25 watts less than the Falcon. That means it can use the 150 watt supply, which just so happens to be much shorter, even with the case. There is almost, almost enough room to fit it in here without modifications, but not with the original cable. And while a right angle cable could fit, the actual cord would need to come out the top, and that would force me to install the supply like this, which may seem okay, but let me draw your attention to these two little gaps here and here. Did you know that 360 power supplies have internal fans? I never did, but it turns out they all do, and on this model, those are the intake and exhaust ports. There's two more on the bottom, and I don't want to suffocate those. With the lid on, those ports would be sucking desperately at two tiny little channels above and below the supply and pulling in air that was pre-warmed by its own waste heat, so that sucks. I want those vents to face outwards so they can get a bite at the cold air being pulled in by the rear fan, and the only way to do this would be to use a right angle IEC cable where the cord exits from the other side. That turns out to be very hard to find. There must be a standard somewhere that requires it to come out this direction because every cable is exactly the same. Except this one. Triplight sells a left angle IEC, which you can get on Amazon for 10 bucks. It's exactly the same as any other, except that the cord exits from the other side. And just like that, my problem is solved. I can fit the supply into the case with just, just barely enough space. I kind of hate how tight it is, but, you know, since none of this stuff is conductive, it doesn't really matter if it touches due to the vibration or whatever, so enough really is enough in this case. Now, as far as mounting the supply, I think it would be adequate to just let it lay in here, not retained in any way. It's probably not going anywhere, and it's not likely to hurt anything if it does, but the vents on the bottom are touching the base plate, which isn't ideal. I'd prefer to suspend it so it can get a bit more air. And I was planning on doing this by just taping it to the side of the chassis. I don't love using adhesives like that, but given how long the tape under that third fan has lasted, a good 17 years, it'd probably be fine. Unfortunately, I couldn't get any 3M VHB on short notice, but I found this Gorilla Tape that's ostensibly rated up to 248 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's probably enough for an Xbox 360. I applied three big strips to the back, and while the surface isn't perfectly flat, I think there's enough contact to hold it all in place. And then after I stuck it all on there, I realized I could just put a couple rubber feet on the bottom of the supply, and that would do the exact same thing without making it impossible to replace if it ever fails. So, yeah, a huge waste of time. Anyway. The supply is taken care of, now we just have to hook up the power inlet. We need to attach this cable to the IEC socket, so I lopped the end off. Now Nivea soldered their AC wires on, but I prefer removable parts, so I went with these crimp spade connectors that have built-in heat shrink tubes. Uh, that'll sort of make up for my 
imprecision with a stripper. I had to carefully remove the old wires from the socket tabs and clean all the solder off, but the spade lugs fit just fine after I did that, so I crimped them onto the IEC wires, shrunk the shrink, and that was that. The only remaining task was to crimp a spade and a ring lug to a piece of wire to make a ground strap, then bolt that into place. And just like that, the machine is now about 90% safer. The cable is also routed over the rear fan instead of under the motherboard, which is a lot better, and a simple 3M stick-on cable clip holds it in place. The final thing I had to deal with was the DC cable, and fortunately that required a lot less alteration. In order for it to make the bend to plug into the board, I did have to cut off the PVC strain relief, but I was able to keep the plastic shell intact, so there's no exposed metal anywhere, nothing like that. And as for the excess length of the cable, I just coiled that up and stuck it to the faceplate with a couple more 3M cable clips. And then very suddenly, I was done. I plugged it in, fired it up, and lo and behold, I was able to start and play a game. Several games, actually. I ran the machine on my workbench for several hours, I played a whole bunch of games, then I went and stress tested it the next day, played some more games for over a few more hours, everything worked great, and I'll talk about the results in a minute, but now that I knew the thing was working, I had to do two final housekeeping tasks. From my testing, the thermals were looking great, so I guess I got the die pressure perfect on my first try, or close enough. I wanted the sink bolts to stay exactly where they were so that wouldn't get messed up, so I added a dab of blue thread lock to the tip of each bolt. Now, I've seen this approach work many times before, putting the thread locker on the tip like that, but for complicated reasons that I don't fully understand, this Loctite did not and will never set up. I guess Smith Acrylate doesn't like passivated metal surfaces, like my black oxide coated bolts, uh, it doesn't like contaminants, uh, some non-ferrous metals, and a lot of other things, so yeah, I guess I'll have to find a different solution for that, uh, suggestions accepted if they aren't super glue. Uh, the other problem, though, was easier to solve. Uh, it irritated me greatly that Nivius soldered flying leads to the front panel board, but didn't stake them in place with silicone so they wouldn't tear themselves off the board. I wanted to correct this, so I went out and got some automotive RTV, uh, and I picked that because of this line right here. Sensor safe means that this is alcohol cure. That's safe on electronics. Most hardware store silicones, like caulking, are acid cure. You can tell because they smell like vinegar. Those will destroy your electronics. Don't use them. This stuff is safe readily available, inexpensive, and blue. Uh, of course, I've never done this before, so I did an incredibly ugly job, but it's better than what Nivius did, which was nothing. I gave the RTV a couple hours to set, then plugged the front panel board into the motherboard and hit the back of the plug with a big glob of hot glue so it doesn't shake itself loose like it had when I first got it home. I could have used RTV for this as well, but then it would be nearly impossible to unplug it again. Hot glue, on the other hand, will lift right off if you just hit it with a dab of isopropyl alcohol, so the next person who works on this, which will probably be me, won't have a miserable time. And with that, I was done. The post-mortem on this whole thing is a bit embarrassing, I have to admit. I had hoped to fix all of Nivius's flubs, and I did repair the really big ones, but I didn't do everything I'd hoped to, and I introduced some of my own in the process. As with any project like this, unless you're truly dedicated and have an unlimited supply of patience, at some point you just run out of energy and start half-assing things. And I'm no saint, let me tell you. For instance, I'd... Uh, hoped to fix all the issues with cable management because there's just a whole bunch of uh, loose wires hanging out in there, but I didn't even end up putting the heat shrink back on the IR sensor leads. I, I waited too long to do it and I realized it wasn't possible. I just didn't want to take everything apart again. Uh, also, since I discovered my screw up with the, the white wire coming off the power button so late in the process, the replacement is now routed even worse than it was to begin with. It's sort of, um, sort of stuffed under the rear fan there. I think it's I think it's trapped under the power supply. I'm sure it's eventually gonna pop up and start getting into the blades. I'm gonna have to fix that eventually. Uh, the power button itself is also very loosely mounted since I didn't have the right wrench to tighten it and I didn't think to just take the faceplate off to make that easier. Maybe I'll fix that someday, yeah. I'll definitely fix that, yeah, sure. I also didn't clip off the extra wires on the DVD header cable for some reason. Those are just hanging out, I should probably fix that. Uh, also, while the power supply situation is largely an improvement, I mean, certainly the thing is considerably safer, if I was doing this right, I would have made sure that all the chassis parts were properly grounded. Now, mind you, I've decreased the probability of the power supply's innards contacting the chassis by about 100% since the supply itself is actually properly insulated, so the ground is much less vital than it was. I also wish that I'd used right angle spade connectors for the AC input. The ones I chose stick out way too far, and they forced me to sort of um, snake the AC cable between the AV and the Ethernet. It's, uh, 
Not ideal, but at least that is something that's easy to fix later. Really though, the thing that frustrates me the most is the hard drive. You've probably seen me fiddling with this a little bit during the video. It, eh, yeah, I didn't even mention that in the teardown, but I did have to put a hard drive in here. There was no really good way around it, and there's no good way to do that with this case. Obviously, as I showed you, the official 360 drive module is useless, but I found that if you tear one open, pull out the adapter cable inside, and trim some of the plastic off the plug, there is just enough room between the board and the fan to wedge it into the socket. And this works well enough, but there's just nowhere to put the drive itself. I mean, the, the cable is too short for this to safely rest anywhere except here on top of the GPU tower. And, you know, I could get a SATA extension cable, but frankly, I don't know if there's a better place than the GPU tower. There's just really no flat surfaces in here. There's no safe place to stick anything. I think the only place you could possibly go would be up here, like next to the DC cable or under it or something. Yeah, I don't know, it sucks. But on the other hand, this is an SSD and I've run it for several hours sitting on top of the GPU cooler with no problems, so maybe it's just fine there. And you know, I'd hoped to avoid the drive entirely. I wanted to just put all the software on one of those super low profile USB drives and plug it in the back and forget about it. But suffice to say, while that is possible, I found the process janky and there were some limitations. So I guess this is the solution I'm sticking with. And then there's just the fact that after all my blustering in the last two videos, I didn't actually get the thermal compound off of everything. It's still kind of, smeared all over, and that's after I worked on this thing for several days. Nivius's assembly techs probably had like eight hours to churn out one of these machines, so I did a worse job given a lot more time, and I feel kind of bad about that, but you know what makes me feel a lot better? I'm not charging someone $1,500 for this. In the end, this is just a hobby project, and that means it's allowed to be kind of shitty. It's my problem, not anybody else's. So. While I do sort of get why Nivius cut so many corners, given what a pain this was to assemble, if they really needed to get these slammed together so fast that they couldn't do anything resembling a good job, maybe that was a sign they were barking up the wrong industrial tree. But in any case, the thing is done, and it does work. And in almost every functional sense, it should be the same as when I got it. Uh, specifically, I didn't do anything to deliberately improve the thermals. I'm probably getting more even pressure on the chips than Nivius was. It'd be kind of hard for that not to be the case. They'd done such a bad job. And I used notionally better thermal compound, but not like liquid metal or anything. And I didn't even lap the heat sinks, and they really could have used it. So I think we're getting a fairly good impression of what this system could do, as delivered by Nivius. And it seems like the Mad Men really did it. Given the temperatures that I saw in testing, this seems to run as well as any 360 could be expected to, despite having no active cooling on the primary components. Now it is worth mentioning that the Jasper uses newer, lower power chips than the Falcon, so technically this is an apples and oranges comparison. But I'd say it's more honey crisp and red delicious. The original cooling solutions for both consoles weren't all that different. They fit into the same space, they both used aluminum sinks, they had the same fans and ducting. I mean, the early Jaspers actually used the exact same cooler as the Falcon. And even if there is a 25 watt difference between the two, I feel like the Nivius is so overbuilt that it would have just eaten that up. I could be wrong, we'll never know for sure, but for my money, this looks like the real thing to me. And that's pretty wild because based on what I've been told, Nivius didn't employ any engineers. This is all just hobbyist work. It's half-assed and eyeballed, and yet it seems to me that they built a system that could have actually worked as a game console, and maybe even lasted longer than an off-the-shelf 360. So the real tragedy, I think, is that they didn't keep doing it. I think with a bit more care and forethought, Nivius could have made a business out of this. And it might have saved them for all we know. It's hard to say when the first Edge actually shipped to a customer, but I get the impression that it was late 2007 at the earliest, at which point Netflix's streaming service had been around for a year, and Hulu and Apple TV both had their own streaming services, and even back then it was obvious that these were going to eradicate home theater as we knew it. Nivius could have read the writing on the wall and picked that moment to abandon the home theater market, which hadn't made them rich in three years and was now almost certainly moribund. 
They could have pivoted into selling heavily modded consoles to the growing pool of enthusiast gamers. And with the extreme popularity of the 360 at all market levels, I think there would have been people willing to spend $1,500 or $2,000 for a better made version of this exact thing. I think Nivius could still be around today, still selling passively cooled versions of every console that comes out if they'd taken that route. And that would be a neat addition to the world, but, well, they didn't. And well, ain't that the way the cookie crumbles more often than not. So that's it for Nivius. I don't think I'm gonna have any more videos about them, but I wanna thank you all for watching this uh, little mini series. It's been fun to make and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did and you haven't seen the other two videos in the series, well, I linked them in the description and I think they're a blast in their own right. So maybe check those out if you've got time. Also consider subscribing to my channel so I know you're into the sort of things I'm doing, that'd be great. If you wanna find out when I put out new videos, maybe turn on notifications. Uh, but if you really wanna help me out, then consider subscribing to my Patreon like these folks here are doing. This is very much the kind of open-ended experimental crap that I always wanted to get up to and I'm so glad I got the opportunity to do it. But it's only possible because of support from viewers like you. Since I don't have to go to a day job, I have the time to put eight or 12 hours of labor into this silly thing and make multiple trips to the hardware store to buy parts and whatnot, but it also means I rely on my patrons to buy my groceries and pay my rent and whatnot. So I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's supporting me. Thank you all so much for making this possible and everyone else, thanks for watching.